so uh, dear dear guests dear colleagues uh, it's a pleasant opportunity to begin with a series of lectures connected to the project testing the boundaries and paving the way to democratization we are glad that we have uh, together produced and opened a splendid exhibition on the same topics we are here from in this project from Slovenia, Austria, Poland, Hungary, uh, Lithuania, Italy, and I think uh, today uh, it's quite interesting uh, connection between Italy and Slovenia when we will open some interesting questions. Uh, I must say we have now uh, in the museum also the exhibition of photo photos from oppositional movements in Slovenia from 80s and uh, colleague Natasha Sterlich has named it cultural transition. Prenova in Slovenian is uh, one meaning is really transition, the other could be renewal. And I think this project is uh, somehow testimony about transitional efforts and about, of course, renewal of, uh, of societies uh, we have mentioned. I think the basic uh, effort we will put in is how to, to let's say, deepen East, East relations. Of and of course, our, our message is somehow goal of our message is also to inform West about what was happening in the East. I think our first lecturer is Dr. Marko Stepac. He has joined me also at the exhibition. I think he's an excellent person uh, who, who really knows what culture transition is. He's a specialist in World War I also one of the historical fields that was neglected in communism, especially in Slovenian case. It was quite uh, unpleasant situation because we, the Isonso Front, the Soska Fronta is uh, of course uh, a European phenomena that uh, needs to be, uh, to be elaborated uh, and must be thought in European framework and uh, colleague Stipas has made this uh, cultural transition in, uh, so he, he imported uh, World War I in Slovenian conscious with all the modernization. I think he will, uh, he will now try to, to show his sensibility for this cultural, cultural uh, let's say, uh, empathy with uh, Slovenian authors that have tried first generation and second with the new review. Uh, and his, uh, his lecture has titled Looking for Opposition and Different Kinds of Thinking, Novarevia, New Review. Uh, dear colleague Marco, please begin. Thank you, Dr. Yuri Birman. Thank you. Hello to everyone. I will present a brief overview of history writings as well as social and political context of the creation of Nova Revia, new magazine, whose first number was published in 1982. I will share screen. I hope you see the, the PowerPoint projection. Uh, this contribution uh, is based on the material kept by the museum library and fragments of uh, archives collected for the exhibition Dark Side of the Moon, which consists of numerous details of, on writers on, and editors of literary magazines and their struggle for artistic and political freedom in Yugoslavia. Jan Wirk wrote, Jan Wirk wrote, wrote that writers are, by the way they write, usually locked in school books. They are given the st status of a national monument or pushed into oblivion. Fragments of history that we deal with today are still being pushed into oblivion. In the beginning, I would like to emphasize that there are many texts dealing with individual authors, writers of literary texts and Analysis of their work, for example, a systematic collection of texts uh, in the Interpretatie, Interpretations, collections on individual authors published by Nova Revia, 
abandoned pieces of information of the surveillance of editors, writers, and editorial staff taken from the preserved so-called Udba secret police archives can be found in the books by Igor Umerza, especially the book about uh, Nova Revia published in, uh, in uh, published uh, 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 seven years ago. While I was preparing this text, I missed studies of the problems of Slovene opposition that should be done by the historians. Alej Gabrich, historian, published several texts connected with our topic in his research of cultural politics after 1945. Andrian Lach wrote about Slovene writers fate in prison. Franz Pibernik wrote some important biographies and Marietta Zebots wrote about writers' lives in an encyclopedic form. And of course, some other researchers were made by comparative uh, literature researchers on Slovene modernism and influences which will be not included in my talk today. The reason why liter literary magazines were so important in Slovenia can be attributed to the fact that language was the most essential element of Slovene national identity. Before the Second World War, there were two leading magazines, Lubyansky Zvon, Ljubljana's Bell, and Dom in Svet, Home in the World, which reflected liberal and conservative views of Slovene culture and politics. After the war and the revolution, which cut deeply into the structure of the political and cultural life, the magazines, which were financed, financed, controlled, and later removed by the state, tried to fill in the space. Despite strict political control and self-censorship, individual literary articles tried to preserve more or less successfully the original purpose and significance of literary magazines. Nova Revia, thus continue the tradition of publishing literature magazines in a completely different context of Yugoslav socialism and one party system. In order to understand the stated processes, the 80s in the 20th century, we need to go back to the starting point, to the cut that started with the end of the Second World War and the revolution. The judicial and executive branches of power were all taken over entirely by the Communist Party. Up until 1980, up until 1948, political, cultural, and social development followed the pattern of the Soviet Union. More than 1,900 works in total of print run of 17 million copies were translated from Russian into the languages of the Yugoslav nation, Yugoslav people in the period from 1945 to 1948. The Soviet influence was also felt in the arts, which were dominated by socialist realism. The, pe the period was marked by mass execution of prisoners of wars and also civilians, by trials against the opposition and opponents of the new regime. Agrarian reform and nationalization were carried out. The, uh, the economy was organized on a centrally planned, planned system and run according to five-year plans. An important turning point was the famous Inforum Bureau dispute with the Soviet Union in 1948, which began with Stalin's condemnation of Yugoslav policies, which were allegedly deviating from Marxist-Leninist principles and damaging the socialist bloc. The longer-term consequence of this dispute was a limited opening towards the West in all areas of public life, and the search for what was called Tito's path to socialism or the socialism with human face and so on. The main problem, in fact, the main problem of socialist Yugoslavia remained the same, which was the monopoly rule of the only permitted political party and the associated violation of human rights and lack of democracy. All these circumstances had a strong influence on the possibility of creating new literary magazines that can be considered as conceptual predecessor of Nova Regia. They can be traced back to the 50s. Among them, we can find magazines such as Beseda, The World, Revia uh, 57, and Perspective. Perspective. They were starting point for different ideas and creating the opposition. Publication or prohibition provided a kind of barometer of communist party tolerance. From the magazines Beseda to Nova Revia, we can trace censorship and forbidden, uh, and forbidden articles. The above mentioned predecessors of Nova Revia were founded by the state or its political organization. So, of course, we cannot talk about dissidents in the classical sense of the word. 
However, with their texts, the authors encountered narrow boundaries of the political system. According to one of its editors, Yanko Kos magazine Beseda was set apart from other oppositional magazines as, I quote, a magazine for literature and culture, which did not interfere with the political field. It was impossible to act in a different way in those conditions at that time. In the field of fiction and especially poetry, it remained, it remained within the framework of personal confession, the so-called intimism. But with the, with the polemical essays, it soon brought out censorship and criticism of the Communist Party apparatus and its leading ideologist for culture, Boris Zikharay. Among them, those essayists, Loise Kovacic crossed the limits of self-censorship most decisively with his Ljubljana postcards and the Golden Lieutenant. As a result of which the magazine was also discontinued and the issue was confiscated, a trial was initiated against the writer Loise Kovacic and his editor for insulting socialism in Yugoslav People's Army. Ljubljana's postcards also sparked the first major public cultural and political controversy regarding social realism. The writer dealt quite realistically with everyday people and their destinies, but his characters were recognized as idealless lumpen proletarian that are allegedly distorting the image of socialism. But a part of the establishment also recognized his literary power, hence the controversy, that's probably why he was even more dangerous. It is believed that Golden Lieutenant was just an excuse for getting rid of, of, of the unwanted nest, the seda. The socialist elite, elite do not approve of the text. I really do not know why and for what reason, but they were obviously in a big hurry, remembered Loise Kovacic in his interview for the second number of Nova Revia. The neorealistic, socially critical, and sharp Ljubljana postcards was the first public cultural controversy after the confrontation with writer and politician Edward Hodgbeck in his book Strach and Pogum, Fear and Courage. Courage. Revia 57, as a successor to Beseda in terms of the context and personal, was also founded by the state and published by the Yugoslav Students Association. It was financed uh, by the state and dependent on the state subventions in the same way as Beseda. The writers leaning on a sort of neo-Marxism did not renounce Marxism. It represented them, them a part of a wider platform for existentialism, which were in the way, in that way, introduced into the student consciousness. Because of that, Revia 57 was discussed several times at the meeting of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, specifically because of Jorge Puchnik's articles. Unfortunately, we do not discuss only concepts, but people and their relatives who were wiretapped, monitored, and punished. In October 1958, they decided to confiscate the magazine, namely its double issue number five and six, in the same year, Jorge Puchnik was arrested for the first time. The magazine was finally forbidden in 1959. Some writers were out of work, pushed out of cultural life and under investigation for hate propaganda against socialism. Some writers tried to publish elsewhere, for example, in the magazine Sodobnost, Contemporaries. After the abolition of Revia uh, 57, the authorities allowed in 1959 the establishment of the magazine Perspective, Perspectives. In the first two years, the editorial board was composed of writers of Revia 57. It was obviously an attempt, or a attempt at some kind of liberalization of better stuff, soft, softening of repression, because at the same time, some of Edward Kotzbeck's texts appeared cautiously in the public eye. Writers of the perspective were creatively very strong and personally autonomous. The magazine was banned in 1964. The chairman of the ideological commission of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, Stane Kaucic, played an important role in this. At the same time, state organized public protest interrupted theater play Topla Greda, uh, so called Greenhouse, Marian Rojan's play. Play criticized the party's agricultural policy. 
The book edition of the play was banned and printed only 25 years later. At that time, poet Tomas Shalomon had to go to prison because of the poem Duma 1964, which was controversial for the regime because of its form and also because of the verses like socialism a la Ludwig XIV. The regime once again imprisoned Jorge Puchnik for his so-called anti-state activities. In the 10th June 1980, 60 Slovene intellectuals suggested a creation of a new cultural magazine. It was the time following the death of President Josip Rostipo, the time of growing economic and social crisis with very high inflation and ethnic tensions in Kosovo. The concept of the new magazine, new would still be written with a small letter, was to become a magazine of new criteria new distinction and differences. The, document, the documents from 1980 to 1982, as well as the chronology of the creation of Nova Revia, which were published in the first two issues of the magazine in the article documents, unveil intense obstruction of the formation of the magazine. In the second number of Nova Revia, chief editor Tine Hriber drew attention to the developing, developing and connection with the dissident Predecessor, predecessors, I quote, we are apparently going back to where we were 20 years ago. We can again observe the same outlines for a more free and creative cultural life as in the beginning of the 60s. Ideological regression that embraced, embraced us in the mid 70s led us to the economic consequences which clearly demand a new economic and cultural policy. The starting point for the new magazine was the knowledge that literary ideological projects have been historically exhausted so they can only get repeated and perfected. Therefore, it is absolutely necessary to return to the essence, essence of work of art. In their aims and writings, we can recognize that their most important values were own autonomous way, not being part of the completed ideological projects, free exchange of ideas and views. And we can find the words such as open-mindedness, adventure, surprise, etc., which formally anticipate a transition from all Orwell's totalitarian new speak to an autonomous speak of individuals. Despite, despite intense political and media pressure, Nova Revia survived and became the core of the formation of the civil movement the opposition's drive to democracy and later also to the independence. Its importance grew due to the alertness of the Communist Party to any critical judgment of the society, especially numerous taboo subjects in history, Second World War Revolution and the role of the Communist Party. Words and different kinds of thinking were extremely powerful in an ideolo ideological monistic society. The most famous, Notorious was the 57 issue of the Nova Revia with the articles of the Slovene National Program, which linked the issue of Slovene sovereignty to demands of, for democracy and placed it at the forefront of the political confrontation. It was published on February, on 20 February 1987. Uh, together with Nova Revia, together with uh, magazines such as the Students' Tribuna, Weekly Mladina, Magazine, magazine Problem and others slowly created the public space for democracy and an alternative to, to the existing culture and political monopoly. Uh, and, and at the end, and at the end, uh, we must not we must not forget that in the above mentioned magazines, excellent texts and poems were found. Were found placing their authors in the pinnacle of Slovenian literature and thought. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, dear Marco. I think the next speaker <laughs> will complete, uh, will somehow turn our attention to the other pillar of processes of democratization and culture renewal in the 80s. It's, uh, Official, uh, official newspaper of the Socialist Youth Organization that have turned somehow, let's say, in, uh, in, in real 
uh, dialogue producing uh, media. Uh, Dr. Bernard Nijmach is excellent person to testify as ex-editor of Mladina in most turbulent times, and now in Slovenian public still the voice of, uh, let's say, I would say critical reason, active in different uh, public debates, but especially his research field is journalism, media, and uh, how in Slovenian history, in principle, the truth was and concealed and discovered. Uh, dear Bernard, please. Okay, thank you, Jorge. Um, I uh, would like to give some insight in the role of Medina, but from uh, more from the contextual point of view. Uh, namely, we can we can talk on the role of let's say literary magazines uh, in uh, changing the framework of society, but we should stress the the let's say the historical. Uh, context. And I here I would like to show you uh, one, one uh, point, one picture. Historical context. In Slovenia, let's say, with the end of the Second World War, when there was a period of liberty, which uh, preceded the, the time of occupation, uh, the, the landscape of dailies were made of five <laughs> different uh, uh, <clears throat> newspapers. And what happened, what brought the, the liberty to those uh, Slovenian tradition was Slovenian Narod, which was established in, in, in the middle of 19th century, uh, published the last copy on 28th of April 45. Slovenets, who was uh, the oldest daily, uh, founded in uh, 1865, uh, died on 4th of May in 45. Utro, liberal daily, uh, which started its, its uh, life in uh, 1920, also died on 4th May, 1945. Marburger Zeitung, uh, in, which was published in German, was founded in, uh, in the middle of 19th century. And its last copy came, uh, I mean, in the public on 8th of May. And the fifth daily, Slovensky Dom, <coughs> started its uh, project in 35. And the last time he he uh, he <coughs> he met the audience was twenty eighth of April forty five. So, with the with the win of this anti Nazi coalition in Slovenia, actually collapsed the whole tradition of journalism. I mean, newspapers were all. Uh, it, it's somehow also a significant paradox. During the Second World War, under the occupation, they were restricted uh, with, a, let's say, harsh censorship. But anyway, they still existed. In the new, or under the new regime of Communistic Party, all of them finished their role in, in history. So it is the question now, of course, there was not the the uh, the hole in the uh, I mean in, in daily newspapers. They were replaced by two communist newspapers, Slovenski Poročevalec and Ljudska Pravica. But that was not just a change of names, but the very nature of journalism. Let's say two points are important here. The pool of editors and journalists was dramatically reduced, as only members of the communist Communist Party and activists of the anti-Nazi resi resistance were employed. Editors, second, editors and journalists no longer belong to an autonomous profession, observing and reporting on events themselves, 
but became social political workers whose task was to build socialism and communism. The new type of journalism was subordinated to the party Politburo, who decided which events would be reported and from which perspective they would be presented. This, of course, created absurd, absurd situations. For instance, in 45, newspapers didn't report on the execution of 20,000 prisoners of war in Slovenia, yet they published on the front page that a literary evening had been organized in Tehran, Persia, to commemorate the Russian writer Maxim Gorky. The journalist thus had in mind not to write about topics relevant to the readers, but to the top of the Communist Party. A career in journalism was not based on the power of text to attract the masses, but on faithfully following the directives of the Politburo. The consequences have been dramatic. Once, Deputy Prime Minister Edward Cardell gave a speech at a public meeting that lasted four hours. How did the reporter, how did the newspapers report it? Did the editor, did the editors select his most important sentences and thoughts? No. Because in the hierarchy of the Communist Party, they were far below the second man of the country. So they didn't dare to decide what was worthy of publication in his speech. The problem was solved elegantly by publishing the full speech. It was eight and a half pages out of 10 in the newspaper. One might, uh, one might ask how many people have even read such an unreadable paper? However, such a question was irrelevant. Newspaper circulation was not a market category, but of a political one. In such a context, was there any possibility for non-communist, so to say, dissident views? They appeared in the daily newspaper at the end of 53rd and in a specific way. In the newspapers with the highest circulation, called Borba, circulation was 3 million copies, an author began to write commentaries in an attractive style instead of the party's language and who asked questions that were blasphemous at the time. For example, is democracy to be applied only to the communist elite or also for its antagonists, and antagonists, uh, antagonists, such as the members of the class of bourgeoisie? His answer was that democratic procedures must also apply to those opposed to the communist party. Or to ask an even more radical question, Communists have their own party, the Communist Party. What about non-communists? Should they have also the right to form a party? And again, the, the answer was yes. A complete heresy in society. How something like this could have happened? The author of the articles was Milovan Gilas, deputy minister and the speaker of the assembly, the man of the big four, Tito, Rankovic, Kadel, and Gilas, who in his close circle ran the country's politics. Since they were always presenting the shared ideas in public with no differences between them, the editors and the people believed that this was the new line of democratization of the party. That Gilas was not writing as a journalist, as an individual, but as a spokesman for the top of the state. Because President Tito was a bon vivant who did not read newspapers, this series of anti-party commands by Gilas was published for almost two months before Tito, together with Ranko Chancardel, took action. Gilas was arrested and then imprisoned for almost 10 years. Paradoxically, the only dissident in the newspapers was one of the country's leader, and it was the only one in the history of daily newspapers. The system that prevented dissidents' view from appearing in the press was underpinned by two principles. The first was frightening. The fate of Gilas was a clear example 
what of what happens to a writer if he questions the ideology of the ruling Communist Party. The second was rewarding. Editors and journalists who carried out the directives of the party summit were guaranteed well remunerated careers in newspapers, in media, and were also rewarded with positions such as trade union leader, minister, and ambassador. The only media in which an unorthodox type of journalism could appear were literary magazines. The case of Nadina, which in the second half of the 80s was considered the central Yugoslav dissident newspaper, is not an example of a dissident project where a group of writers systematic, systematically sought to extend freedom of speech. The weekly Mladina was founded in 1943 as a newsletter for young members of the Communist Party, following the Soviet model of the Komsomol. And for four decades, it operated in the same way as the daily newspapers except that it was aimed at young audience. Its turn, however, came about by mistake. In order to further simplify the control of its editors, the party top began to put the sons of party leaders in charge of the editorial staff. They were not, of course, pursuing the idea of a free press or parliamentary democracy, but the generational revolt of sons against the fathers. This was done by breaking with the established model that the choice of topics is not decided by the Politburo, but by the editorial board of the youth magazine. Without knowing what they were doing, they were abandoning journalism as the mouthpiece of the Politburo and pulling the strings in the direction of autonomous journalism which autonomously decides what the newspaper's topics will be. The first examples did not represent an abandonment of the communist perspective at all. Writing about the miners' strike, for instance, was based on the Marxist concept of the struggle for the rights of the proletarians. The only novelty was that the subject of strikes was taboo at the time. From then on, the dominant editorial concept of Nadina was the breaking of political taboos and thus provoking the authorities. This extended the rebellion of sons against fathers into a new sphere, the orientation of the newspaper towards its readers. The desire to shock and attract the public meant a turn from writing for the party leaders to writing for the masses. Raising circulation spontaneously became the mission of the magazine. But what was the specific feature that distinguished Nadina from the daily newspapers? Because it was a youth newspaper, it gathered, it gathered around it unconventionally formed journalists. Most of them had not been educated at the party oriented faculty of journalism. They were students of philosophy, sociology, literature, art, foreign languages, et similar. They were not themselves former journalists as social and political workers, but sought and created their own styles of writing and thinking. They knew neither the party model of journalism nor the Anglo-Saxon model. And new forms of expression were therefore created, a cartoon, an irony, a gloss, a message mean meaningful cover, the talking photos, but also the most rigorous reports. When a group of participants gathered in a private apartment in Belgrade under the name of the Free University, it was arrested in uh, 83. The daily newspapers presented the trial only through the point of view of the prosecutor, who accused the six of subverting the constitutional order of the country and demanding heavy prison sentences. This was the established principle 
of reporting events from the perspective of the Communist Party for half a century. Mladina broke this tradition, sent a reporter to the trial who recorded the other side of the story, gave the floor to the lawyers for the accused and to a group of German intellectuals who, led by Nobel Prize winner Henry Böll, came to Belgrade to support the imprisoned. The basic principle of covering the story in journalism has the, then re-emerged after half of the century in the literary press. The Consumer newspaper Mladina, which began its metamorphosis through a generational revolt, became a model for the transition from party journalism to an autonomous profession at the end of the 80s. So this was a brief review of say, the position of Nadina towards the uh, official dailies. I uh, didn't speak uh, on uh, censorship. Uh, there's a huge story uh, about the tactics, strategies, how to cope with uh, the restrictions uh, concerning the uh, freedom of, of, of speech. Uh, this would be the topic uh, profoundly uh, studied in the article uh, itself. Okay. Okay, S splendid. Uh, I think uh, this um, introduction in uh, next phase of the project that will be the book was, uh, was quite interesting, intriguing. And now uh, our next speaker is Alinka Puchar. She was also part in very important part of the events in the 80s in Slovenia, of the part of, uh, of team of Nova Revia. Uh, but otherwise, she was, uh, she was uh, let's say, somehow conscious of uh, Slovenian memory, conscious of Slovenian journalism. Uh, she also began some uh, groundbreaking studies with, let's say, is Pravatno Besedilo Zilenje, original original texts of life, uh, history of childhood after uh, Lloyd the Mouse technology. She introduced in her nearly huge production of interventions where she really critically made nervous some, uh, some let's say, fans of the old Titoism, old system of maintaining revolutionary traditions. And she is doing that in great shape also today. Uh, with uh, her uh, with her text, we are moving to this Slovenian Italian Italian border relations to Ters Trieste Trieste as uh, as let's say uh, some of the major problems of Cold War, and I would say uh, on one level the on the Slovenian Yugoslav borders toward west toward Austria and Italia, people were shot till the fall of the system. On the, on the other side, uh, in Trieste, 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 there was uh, Slovenian population, Slovenian refugees, Slovenian minority uh, that has created uh, splendid critical work uh, facing totalitarian systems. And the leading person was our poet, our, let's say, 110 years old he has, when he has died. And Alinka has, uh, has um, excellent research about him. And I think also the title of her lecture is quite suitable for this Slovenian Italian problems because I think there, there, will, be, there will be ones, I hope will be on, on both sides of the border we can face Italian persecution of Slovenes in fascism and afterwards, and also uh, communist or Slovenian or Croatian persecution of a, a Italian minority in Slovenia, Croatia. The time will come, but for now, I think Alenka will open uh, some, uh, some basic features of this East-West or anti-communist or critical to totalitarian systems 
interventions of Boris Pachor, who was really victim of fascism, national socialism, and communism on one side, and on, on the other side, he was uh, a victorious case for, of, uh, of uh, let's say, permanent struggle to, to keep civilization alive. Alinka, please. Thank you, Yuzha. Hello, everybody. Uh, well, the title of my presentation uh, is Bridge Over Troubled Water. Uh, this is not meant as a compliment to Simon Gunkwanko, although I wouldn't mind it uh, as I was quite a fan many, many years ago. Bridge is a bridge, and in this case, the title of the literary journal, Most. While Troubled Water is the Trieste Bay or Gulf, the northern part of the Adriatic Sea. In this case, the title of the second journal, Zaliu. The status of Trieste and its port was subject of long disputes and battles, so troubled spot indeed. Churchill made it famous when he offered the notion of the Iron Curtain from Stettin in the Baltics to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent, runs his famous statement. East of that line, communist parties are seeking everywhere to obtain totalitarian control. Quite the right place then, Trieste, over the Trieste Gulf, at the end of Iron Curtain and East-West Division, to look for magazines and journals that paved the way towards democracy. Both journals, Most and Zalu, were published for about 25 years, not in Italian, but in Slovenian language, as Trieste and Gorizia, plus the surrounding countryside, were incorporated into Italy after World War II, with a significant Slovenian minority cut off from the majority living in Slovenia or Yugoslavia. The journals were created by two groups of intellectuals, one the most group, quite young and modernist oriented, while Zaliu was in some ways more traditional. It was started by a middle-aged Boris Pachor, who died recently at the age of almost 109. The dividing line in this region was not just the state border after 45, it was 45 into Iron Curtain. Quite difficult to cross for many years. Not as magnificent as the Berlin Wall, but strong enough. What does the ambition of totalitarian control mean? It means that there were significant differences in a vast number of fields and rules on press freedom, freedom of speech, freedom to organize and participate in various activities of political character. Whereas in Slovenia, it was very complicated, almost impossible to start a journal. One needed official support of an organization and the adherence to the editorial concept, which was regularly controlled. The process was quite simple in Italy. One had to apply for the court registration and the court only demanded was for the applicant to be a member of journalist society, to be a professional. Many different magazines and newspapers therefore appeared in Trieste in Slovenian language. Most of them shortly as they were never, uh, as there was never sufficient financial uh, support. 
This, of course, was true of the publications not approved and therefore not supported by the authorities in Slovenia. At the same time, quite generous support was available for the publications that stayed in line, meaning unconditional support for the party line in Yugoslavia. Most and the leave starting in 1964 and 66 survived for about a quarter of a century and remained independent. They were not allowed to enter Slovenia freely as everything published abroad was subjected to rigorous control before the permit was issued. A rather mysterious trading company was in charge of these commercial activities, Adit, run by secret police. This meant important disadvantage. Reading public within Slovenian minority was small. A few copies were sold to emigrants all over the world. But the most important reading public in Slovenia was almost unavailable. It could only be reached with some risk. Most in the league could be found from time to time among very few, silently passed from hand to hand. Anyhow, special teams working within the Ministry of Interior were combing through all the papers and magazines from uh, foreign countries, looking for dangerous, controversial articles. Of course, they knew from long experience that Burda and Grazia could be trusted. That's ladies' fashion magazines. Uh, and they were freely available, uh, Burda and Grazia from 60s, mid 60s on. On the other hand, one, on the other hand, one could never be sure what fuss uh, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung or the Spiegel or Zirher Zeitung or Time and Die Presse or so on and on will publish. And one was quite sure that most and the lead had to be read carefully. The new stands in Yugoslavia were quite colorful from mid 60s on. Uh, in, meaning after two decades of communist rule. During the summer period, with tourists in mind, they would pay special attention to papers and magazines all over Western Europe. But they never saw them if something unfriendly was found in their content. And they never saw the journals and papers in Slovenian or Serbo-Croat language published by the emigrants or Zameci, meaning members of national minorities in the neighboring countries. These were only occasionally available in some specialized bookshops. Both magazine, magazines, most and the least, followed the tra traditional concept, some poetry, some prose, Reviews of literary works, art criticism, and articles on current events, with a strong interest in the most controversial issues, including recent history. Fiction was never particularly suspicious. Its sensitive part was more, more author's personal status than art itself. In Trieste, literary contributions from writers banned at home, usually for being enemies of the people or unpersons, were welcome. Some foreign authors in this category were translated, like Brodsky, for example. Here is a copy of Moss from 65 with Brodsky Great elegy to John Dunn, translated in 65. 
to publish Brodsky at the time in Slovenia itself would be unthinkable. The most controversial issues were of three types and dealt with the past, the present, the future. Let's start with the past because, and now I quote, in Eastern Europe, the past is palpable and heavy in perceptive words of Marcy Shore, an American historian. The past is also merciless, she continues. By history's caprice, here the Second World War and communism were, were inseparable historical traumas, one bleeding into the other, as Nazi power gave way to Soviet domination. This may seem odd to Western Europeans, Nevertheless, it's very true. The past, especially the painful mid 20th century past, has been one of the most sensitive issues. Both journals presented here paid a lot of attention to this dangerous territory. Historical facts were studied, remembered, described, cross examined analyzed, discussed. The second sensitive issue, the present. Current political developments were closely followed in these journals from different angles, often in polemical tones and without servility that was more or less compulsory in Yugoslavia. And now the future, the most important future, future oriented subject were the fate of socialism as a project and system, then the nature of nation, ethnicity, national identity and the state, plus of course, the status of national minorities. Zaliu with Boris Pachor was closely involved with various minorities all over Europe. To put it into a nutshell, many subjects that could not be discussed in Slovenia were regularly covered and discussed in Most and the Lee. Something central was kept alive in the periphery, the stress, by Loise Peterle, the first prime minister of independence Slovenia. There were three cases of court interventions towards the citizens of Yugoslavia, of course, as it was impossible to punish the publishers and authors with Italian citizenship. They were usually punished in a different way. The most prominent and notorious was the case of interview with Edward Kozbeck, a well-known poet and former politician, a partisan during World War II, who was banished from public life. In 1975, he decided to speak out about the most horrible act of how German occupation bled into communist regime with a massive slaughter of the so-called Domobranci. This interview was published in a special edition of the Liu. As it was a bit risky to prosecute Kozbeck, two authors who decided to stand for him Blažić and Miklaučić were arrested and tried in 76, and both spent some time in prison. To sum up, the publication from Trieste, created by two small groups of Slovenes living abroad as members of traditional national minority, 
as well as emigrants, kept alive the idea that different opinions are natural, should be allowed, and expressed. The two journals both gave up in 1990, 92, on the same optimistic note. There is now enough freedom and democracy in the majority lands for the minority in Trieste to take the break. Thank you. Now we will. We will change the direction. If we, with Alinka, we started from Terz Trieste to Slovenia. Now, uh, our next guests, Ivan Paulini and Serge Adamo, are coming from University of Trieste. They are, they are talking not only about cultural, let's say, renewal or transition, but also of translation. I think. The, the translation is something we all need to understand each other. And now, Mr. Ivan Paulini will begin the lecture, then Sergio Adamo will continue. Uh, Ivan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jorge, and good morning to everyone. Well, uh, the Italian language magazine La Battana was founded in 1964 by Eros Sequi. Lucifero Martini and Sergio Turconi, three members of the Union of Italian of Istria and Fiume. I will return later to these quite controversial figures who never truly question communist power. As an introduction, I will now to focus on the highly symbolic significance of the magazine title. A batana is a small sized boat which was common among low classes fishermen. It was quite popular in coastal towns of the North Adriatic Sea, places such like Romagna, Veneto, Venezia, Giulia, Istria, and so on. Since it was used essentially by members of the working class, it had a really simple and basic structure designed to be resistant and easily repairable. Therefore, the reference evoked by the title had as far as we can guess by the intention of the three founders, a double meaning. On the one hand, the image of a modest ship thought to challenge the strength of the wind and the sea, humble but resistant, perfectly matches the magazine's editorial line, or at least with the very first intentions of Sequi, Martini and Turconi. On the other hand, the name implicitly remarks an historical, geographical, and cultural aspect shared by two nations, North East Italy and what was called Yugoslavia. So we have a metaphorical image referring to both modesty and ambition, but also a clear connection to the multiple ethnic groups living in the North East side of Adriatic Sea. As I mentioned, the magazine was founded in 1964. As we all know, it was an extremely del delicate historical and cultural moment, both for Italy and Yugoslavia, even more so when we consider that the magazine was born out of the Union of Italians of Istria and Fiume, a cultural association founded in 1944 in Fiume. Since the main topic of this lecture is the magazine's life through three decades, I won't embark on an examination of the intricate sequence of events connecting the Union of Italians and the Yugoslav and Italian political atmosphere. I just want to remark that Sequi, before founding the magazine with Martini and Turconi, Turconi had been performed the duties of president of the Union. Moreover, we should also consider that the activities of the Union were strictly supervised by the Yugoslav Communist Party, a supervision which became more and more alert after Tito's breaking with Stalin in 1948. Being part of the Italian minority in a multi-ethnic state living in Istria could be problematic by itself. It also became necessary to guarantee intellectual distance from both the common forms and Italian Communist Party positions, which was the strongest Communist Party of the West Bloc. So the Union of Italians was marginalized as much in Yugoslavia as in Italy. Still, I must clarify that during the 60s in Yugoslavia, the ruling 
class gradually and cautiously relaxed political opposition to the West. This process was facilitated by the difficult relationship with the East Bloc. It is in this peculiar atmosphere that La Batana was born. In order to clearly understand the magazine's editorial line at its very beginning, I will quote a passage from La Batana's first editorial. Almost 20 years have passed from the end of the war. The Italians of Yugoslavia are now supporting a magazine which overcoming the marginalization at the border of two cultures is now trying to create a meeting point between them. Even if open, the borders existing between Italy and Yugoslavia, also considering the distance from the mother culture, inevitably cre create a risk of cultural stagnation. On one hand, La Batana wants to contribute to the cultural and literary life of the Italians of Istria and Fiume, to avoid the risk of minority provincialism. On the other hand, La Batana wants to guarantee the living presence of an Italian and Yugoslav culture in order to sustain together the cultural ferment and the active participation to the literary creation. Performing this duties, La Batana is going to achieve a much bigger task, that of being the meeting point between Italian and Yugoslav writers. However, the magazine is not going to offer just a passive introduction to the literary life of both sides, but will bring to the surface the leading problems belonging to the two countries and will embrace each possible contribute to the debate. So as we can see, the editorial line had three purposes. First, to avoid the after effect of minority enclosure encouraged by a self-referential literature by taking part in the European literary debate. Second, to sustain emerging artists, both Italian and Yugoslav, encouraging the debate on the renewal of aesthetic forms. Third, to have the Italian minority play a role of cultural mediation, but also to engage with the different artistic trends which were going through a rapid evolution within that historical context. We can notice that during the 60s, the union of Italians was simultaneously going through a tentative democratization. As an example, the union reopened the debate on the bilingualism issues. So the magazine seems aware of the risks of an editorial line, which was also however felt to be deeply necessary considering the political atmosphere of both Italy and Yugoslavia. At the risk of being flattened between two cultures, La Battana was able to carve out for itself a very particular role of cultural and aesthetic mediation. Not by chance, the magazine had assumed a strongly multidisciplinary identity since the first issues. In the table of contents, we find poets belonging to the Italian community, community at the beginning of the Eucharist, critical essays about Umberto Saba's late writings, a review of the Yugoslav pavilion, uh, pavilion at Biennale di Venezia, a critical reading of Gramsci. And moreover, we also find reproduction of works by Accardi, Pomodoro and Dubieniak. In the following issues, many sections were also devoted to cinema, which later resulted in, resulted in monothematic numbers dedicated to new forms and a representative technique in Italia and Yugoslav independent cinema. So the following issues reinforced and consolidated the editorial, the editorial line. It was quite common to find in the magazine literary and artistic works of the beauty talents next to works of well-established artists belonging both to Italy and Yugoslavia. Almost every issue included critical essays about aesthetic issues. I will only mention, and as an example, the names of Italo Calvino, Franco Fortini, Mario Luzzi and Gillo Dorfles, recording more and more in the history of the publication. In this sense, I think it is important to remark the large space dedicated to the neo-avant-garde scene. During the following 20 years of publication, 
the debate involving the renovation of aesthetic forms played a key role in the magazine's pages. Italian collective such, such as Gruppo 70 and Gruppo 63 involving names such as Lucia Marcucci, Nanni Balestrini and Elio Pagliarani advocated for cultural, political and aesthetic change in a way I can say must the Yugoslav experimentalism. I can just mention the Slovenian group OHO. As we can see, avoiding marginalization and provincialism meant taking part in a very intense aesthetic debate which was occurring in Italy and Yugoslavia. This was largely the result of the radically innovative ideas of the neo avant-garde. Debating these issues meant to put in discussion the role played by aesthetic forms in social and political life. You can doubtlessly say that the investigation conducted by La Battana involved the relationship between culture, aesthetics and politics. In this way, theoretical engagement took the shape of annual congresses organized by the magazine directors in Abbazia and later in Porto Rose. Some of the most preeminent intellectuals of the Italian panorama were invited to take part to the debate, including Cesare Segre, Maria Corti, Umberto Eco, Andrea Zanzotto, and so on. I believe that the theme regarding the first Congress, 1965, is really relevant. Literature today, possibility of engagement, industrial society, and expressive techniques. Following the same line, Congresses of the following years will involve impactful matters such as literature and audience, 1966, and instrument and purposes of critics, 1967. Once more, the real question was, is there any possibility of adapting existing aesthetic forms to the social and political changes of our era? And even more, could these aesthetic forms play a key role in a nation going through such a, a delicate cultural transition, Italy, or in a multi-ethnic state not fully aligned between great political forces of the world? If yes, how? So the theoretical debate about literature and art was uh, a way to think about political power and economic power, especially considering that in Italy during 60s and 70s, the debate on the artists social engagement was very lively as part of a strongly polarized political atmosphere. We can now understand how the three goals set by the magazine in the 1964 editorial acquired a significant, significant that went beyond the limits of the Italian community of Istria and Fiume. Being part of a minority community in these terms means not just recreating an ideal identity as evidenced by the magazine's attention to dialectal literature. But in practicing literature, building an identity means questioning about the role of the artist in the community. We can see that this role concerns three main points. First, reforming the language in order to reform the community. Second, confronting ideology and power systems. Third, and most important, connecting cultures. At the same time, critics also had to question their tasks and instruments. I just mentioned, again, as an example, the great effort that Umberto Eco and Maria Corti gave to the magazine, right as they were elaborating the semiotic approach to literature and visual arts. Yet, we can deny that between the 70s and the 80s, the magazine faced a moment of stagnation. On one hand, it increased collaboration with first grade intellectuals such as Giudici, Raboni, Sanguinetti, Magris, but also Andrich, Lalic, Kritisch, Matiej, Pahor. On the other hand, the magazine went through a gradual process of intellectual stagnation, insisting on retrospective themes which had lost their strength and relevance in the literary scene. Simultaneously, the dream of a communist multi-ethnic state started crumbling. I will just recall two quite obvious dates. 
Marshall Tito's death in 1980 and the multi-party election in 1990. As the dictatorship's censorial activity declined, reticence on one side a new uses on the other emerged. This renewing need combined with the thematic stagnation of the magazine required a repositioning of the magazine's editorial direction. So after 25 years, Batana's number 90 in 1988 opened with a Farwell editorial. The following number directed by Ezio Giudicin Elvio Baccarin and Maurizio Tremul opened with an editorial entitled New Series Programmatic Directions. This new chapter of Batana's history opens with an honest report of the previous activities. The new editorial office is, in fact, insisting on three key concepts. The first is continuity with the past. The new series comes has the hair of the clearly structured, mag structured magazine with, five, with 25 years of publication, having a reasonable expertise as background and a recognized role in Italy and Yugoslavia. The second key concept is the intention to mark a turning point. Aware of the early stagnation phase, alert to the change in the social and political European context. The new editorial office insists on the urgency of changing the editorial line in order to reclaim a crucial role in the Italian and Yugoslav cultural scene. Continuity and turning point might appear as a contradiction, a problem which is solved by the third key concept, ethnicity. We have seen uh, why and how the first series was born in a fragile and peculiar social context and how important the concept of national identity was. It was frequently remarked by Sequin Turconi's direction as part of the operation of cultural mediation between Italy and Yugoslavia. This element of continuity must now take note without the shadow of Yugoslav Communist Party or the failure of an ideal a communist state alternative both to the East and West blocs, multi-ethnic and multicultural. An honest analysis of, analysis of mistakes and faults was needed. This was the chance to develop a multi-ethnic society and most of all to reflect upon the role of state and literature in this transformation. I quote a passage from the second editorial. Batana must become an instrument of analysis and debate on the ethnic realities. Such realities are quite difficult, not just cultural and literary, but also and especially social, historical, political, human realities. Whereas the first series had as its main points of interest culture, aesthetics and politics, the new editorial direction is shifting toward writing ethnicity and identity. After this point, magazine, even if anthological, will be organized by social and anthropological themes, resulting in a stronger uniformity than before. As an example, the first number of the second series has the thematic guideline, ethnicity and state. And it is divided into seven parts. What state for minorities? Ethnicity in a multinational state, Yugoslavia. Imagining the future, proposal and reflection from the Italian community. Minorities and international relationships. The European challenge, culture, persistent identity, ethnicity and territories. So as you can see, a sociological vision of the present is accompanied by an historical and anthropological approach on fundamental themes involving concept of nation, state, individual and collective identities. In such a critical moment, the urgency to question common values emerges with the need to rediscover and rebuild social communities. So in concluding this talk, I want to emphasize that 
these themes would later find a literary expression in the third number of the new series with the publication of Martin Muma, the first novel to give a voice to the tragic events happened here before in Goliotok. Thank you all for the attention. I will, <clears throat> if I may. Setia, so, just a second, please. Yes. Uh, I would like to say that the audience has opportunity to put questions after the Sergio's lecture. And uh, I, I, I would say that uh, this kind of di dialogue, I hope, will, we will develop to understand each other better and also perhaps to make some push-ups in, the, let's say, in these cultural directions that were, that were presented in Ivan's, uh, Ivan's, uh, Ivan's uh, lecture. Sergio, please. So thank you very much. I will just add a few thoughts on what Ivan has told us. So I want to start from the publication of the novel Martin Muma in 1990, which stands out as a sort of culmination of what we can consider as the first years of La Battana, although already in the second series. So Martin Muma is the only novel in Italian written by someone, Gio Zanini, who identified himself mainly as a poet and had chosen Istriota as his language of expression. Istriota is a Roman's language spoken by about no more than 400 people in the southwestern part of the Istrian peninsula. And it should not be confused with the Istrian dialect of the Venetian language, so-called Istroveneto. So this choice had been a specific political stance for Zanini, who in 1948, coinciding with the break between Tito and Stalin, had resigned from the Yugoslav Communist Party and was subsequently arrested and sentenced to forced labor on the island of Goli Otok, where he would remain until 1952. So the choice of poetry for Zanini, and that was an extremely sought after poetry, limited to, as he himself wrote, a triangle of land and water, was therefore seen as a political act of identification of a community, as Sergio Turconi wrote in that issue, in another, sorry, another issue of La Battana in 1982, speaking of Zanini's poetic production. Yet in parallel with this poetic production, Zanini had tried for years to tell his experience at Goli Otok and to tell it in Italian as an experience made of disillusionment and disorientation towards his own identity references, both from a political and a cultural point of view. The whole point was a matter of dealing with the failure of a project in which the author had believed and in which he had thought he could reconcile utopia and political commitment with the attachment to an identity which, however, revealed itself increasingly difficult to define. So it is highly significant, I believe, that in Zanini's evaluation of the first acknowledgement of this failure, the image of a boat returns, not La Batana, the fisherman's little boat, but for Zanini, the new regime seems to resemble a badly built boat. Although, he adds, underneath, there was still hope that between socialist countries, there would be no more wars. And even if this last aspiration, Sotinius was dropped, the anguish remained. So I, I, we must notice that Martin Muma was not the first to tell about Goli Otok and what happened there after 1948. Before him, starting from the beginning of the 80s, we can quote Notch do Jutra in 1981 by Brack Hoffman, or Igor Torka, Umiranya Naubrokia, 1984, a work that was recognized as a very courageous political act and triggered an extraordinary public response and awareness of the communist repression. In a deeply moving novel where we, we find um, memory material, documents, and literary fiction, the novel was translated into various languages and uh, for example, uh, Ser uh, Serb, Croatian, and German in 1991. And then especially we must mention Goliotok, the island of death, a diary in letters from 1984 in English by the Bulgarian and Macedonian writer 
poet partisan Venko Markovsky. There are other uh, texts I, I might quote, um, which, um, for example, uh, Karamazovi, uh, which dissected the psychological torture to which the prisoners were exposing Oli Otto. But most of those writers uh, weren't actually uh, prisoners there, like um, Ligio Zanini, uh, as he told us in his Martin Muma. That was the first time, actually, that a narrative of this type has been made in Italian. And this will then open to the historical research of many scholars, uh, which were very important in uh, highlighting the facts, the historical facts of that, of Goliotto. Uh, as, we, uh, as we heard from, from Ivan, La Batana devoted a special issue to Ligio Zanini, where the poet was exalted as a cantor of Istria and the publication was justified with the need to create community in times of crisis, not only with the editorial preface, but also with interventions by illustrious Italian critics such as Giuliano Manacorda and writers such as Mario Rigoni Stern, for example, who define Zanini's novel, quote, an example of how and why a book must be written. So uh, it was really a culmination, a highlight in the history of the journal. At the same time, the intention to overcome the marginal position of the borders of two cultures affirmed in the introduction of 1964 began to fail and the danger of what was then called minority provincialization sorry, became once again very real. Um, an attempt was made at this point to respond to this challenge by highlighting the distance from the mother country as a value and a strength through the possibility of adopting an oblique, alternative, curious gaze. But it was precisely this perspective, this distance, which had allowed La Batana to be at the same time, on the one hand, a militant magazine that was part of the long tradition of 20th century Italian literary journals on the one hand, and on the other hand, an open space, almost ecumenical, I would say, I would dare to say, which still manages today to bear witness to a cross-section of Italian culture between the 1960s and the 1970s. As for the first aspect, the Italian tradition of literary magazines that began in the early 20th century with journals such as La Voce, La Ronda, Solaria, to name just a few of the most important titles, and then continued after Second World War with Menabo, Ficina, Nuovi Argomenti, up to Linea d'Ombra, for example, in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, again, here the list would be very long. So this tradition defines a form of cultural intervention that has literature in its specificity at its center, and at the same time manages to make this a political position in a broad sense, not an alignment, but a frame of reflection and very often of provocation, of challenge, of even radical criticism. And this dimension was certainly very present in the initial intention of La Batana. Uh, furthermore, and I move here to the second aspect I mentioned, um, if, and Ivan has already spoken about that, I will just repeat something he has just said. If the first numbers of La Batana seem to be oriented towards a certain panorama of Italian culture of the 60s that looks at the culture that was consolidated after the war with names such as Calvino, Casola, Bacchelli, Quasimodo, we soon see the names of Eduardo Sanguinetti, Pagliarani, Barilli, Umberto Eco, just a year before the first issue of La Batana, I declared their will to break up in a famous meeting in Palermo, the so-called Gruppo 63, or the neo-avant-garde, so-called. So, uh, the militancy of the Batana essentially consists not in taking a definite line and excluding all the others, but precisely in that much claimed anthological character, this necessity of anthology, which leaves some the experience of the contemporary of the present to be pursued and valued, never to be historicized. Therefore, the reasons why La Batana, especially in its first phase, is not only a historical document, but also a model of cultural intervention, are to be found in its ability to build moments of encounter and dialogue of cross-cultural intervention through the definition of spaces that coincide with the most debated and heated topics of the time. The physical and real encounter, encounters that La Batana's activity created between Italian and Yugoslav intellectuals and artists 
periodically, first took shape on the pages of the magazine and then reverberated its consequences on subsequent reflections and the intellectual choices. So this nexus of problems, to quote Gramsci, always very present at the beginning of La Batana, basically revolved around an open question about the role of art in relation to its reception, to its practical destination. An absolutely open idea of cultural intervention in which the question about reception, audiences, the public was always the starting point with the sheer need for a critical rethinking of the Marxist tradition. And we can see that in various examples since the first, the first issues, uh, for example, the reflections on Gramsci's classicism by the Italianist Niksha Stipcevic in number one, who questions the reasons for the refusal of misunderstanding of contemporary poetry by Gramsci himself, up to Gerald Dorfles, a brilliant aesthetic scholar, who questions in an original way the link between art and communication beyond the literary, and again, up to Sveta Lukic, who in issue number two, reflects on socialist aesthetics by broadening the gaze to cinema and theater. So there was a conference, as Ivan has already mentioned, dedicated to literature, literature today, uh, who allowed a free controversy on the themes of the avant-garde and tradition. And Andrea Zanzotto, for example, a very important Italian poet, responded to that with a reflection on the relationship between power and death, which leads to a condition, Zanzotto writes, of daily terror, in which the immense expansion of science and human power is accompanied by a loss and the unbalancing counter tension which could only be countered by the form of ultimate resistance as a new mode of commitment. So Zanzotto and Fortini, another very important figure in Italian culture of that time, agree on the theme of commitment as a risk and a bet. It is no coincidence that the following conferences focus on literature and the public. And for example, Franco Fortini took the floor to note how necessary it was to keep in mind the context and frameworks in which some debates took shape. Well, when it comes to the functions and tools of criticism, it was Milos Zarniansky intervention, among others, which was very important. So poetry remained, in any case, one of the central uh, elements of interest in La Batana, but it always interact, interacted on the pages of the journal with visual arts and cinema, also considered in their mater material and productive aspects. Uh, for example, a big debate about the cinema, group cinema, independent cinema, and so on and so forth. So La Batana was therefore an opportunity, a real opportunity for Italian culture of commitment to take a position in a non-schematic but open, problematic, oblique way with a series of issues on which the national dimension was asking to work out in which in that marginal precarious dimension was possible to expose doubts and ambiguities. For the Yugoslavian culture, La Batana opened up the possibility of translating, even literally translating into Italian, debates that were critical and new for a Western context, that problematized some axioms of Marxism in a way that was unprecedented and courageous for the West itself. So to conclude, I would define that experience as as already said, as the bet and the risk, something that happened from the margins, a way of living all the contradictions that still speaks to us and whose legacy demands to be rediscovered. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have invested some serious, uh, let's say efforts uh, in new way of thinking, in new way of discovering some facts, some relations, some, let's say, I think even the ideology of the project is building up in this, uh, in this uh, presentations. And I hope the next uh, meetings will uh, give us some more encouragement to do something really important. But now uh, I uh, invite all the participants, all the guests, of our uh, meeting to, to ask questions, give comments, please. Yes, I think uh, if you uh, give me the possibility, 
Yes, I would like to have some questions and remarks. It's possible, Josep. Yes, of course. Uh, you're, uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I'm also uh, author of the project, and I think uh, she has proposed some these cross-border relations. Please, uh, please. Yes, yes, thank you very much. I'm from University of Beach, and uh, I am very happy uh, that uh, hearing all these lectures, I think now uh, I am most convinced than ever that we need to have this project and we need to continue also. Now, um, my question will focus on uh, three points. Uh, firstly, uh, I think that um, uh, all you mentioned uh, that uh, after the, and all we know that Second World War, it was the socialist uh, and Soviet type socialist context, which made this part of Europe um, uh, give an ideological element and pretty much all the newspapers had the same problems, I think in the countries we represent at the moment. My uh, question would be uh, looking at the, the, all the newspapers you represent. Uh, what do you think in these newspapers, uh, how the uh, East, East relations were present, uh, especially in opposition? Because ideologically, we know that uh, everybody had the same duty at the same time. And I think uh, uh, Bernard Nesmark, uh, uh, Nesmark had right that uh, uh, the journals couldn't work anymore like journals, or could they could work in some is that as journals. But my question would be, um, uh, how this East, East relationship in opposition worked and how do you see this effect? Here, I think the Polish Samizdat has a great effect, for example, in Hungarian. And I'm just curious about how in your newspapers, these questions and the reflections on each other uh, oppositional uh, movements are present first. Secondly, uh, um, I think that um, uh, Alenka Buhar and uh, Serja and uh, Ivan uh, spoke uh, uh, very much about the bridges between culture, Slovenia and Italia. Now we focus on them, but um, I would like to see how these relations in time have changed. So uh, we were in the context of Yugoslavia and then in XU, uh, how this uh, period uh, from uh, Yugoslavia to XU situation uh, was present. Uh, even uh, I think Bernard thought about how the youth newspapers uh, were reflecting in Belgrade, uh, who belonged to this Belgrade group, Slovenian, Croatian, and, uh, and, and so on. The third question would be how the female and men um, uh, presence in newspapers and editors uh, are there because in the EU uh, it is also important to have a look on this one and how in time they change at the beginning and, and up to today. Uh, I already made a research and I see that Labatana had uh, from 2000 a lot of female editors uh, by the other newspapers I found only by the Samizdat uh, female participant more and, and editors. So I am just curious about, I know that we cannot answer every question, but it, it is our focus doing this research. Thank you very much. Yes, I think Bernard, uh, you were mentioned uh, and I think in this, um, in this framework, I think it, it would be fine to discuss Yugoslav Slovenian position because the development in Slovenia went from civil society to legal questions to, I think it was to open this, let's say, burden of history in very, let's say, radical public debate. And I think it was really different between Slovenia and South, where this tension between Croats surge between religions and so were, I, I don't know if they were culturally softened. I think this process is somehow special in Slovenia. And, but I would ask Bernard to, 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 to find some uh, remarks on what Joran has asked. Yes. Uh... I'm very, uh, I would say, uh, I would say that I'm satisfied with these questions, but I like them because they open the prolonged discussion. Uh, uh, I would stress two points. First is the relation uh, in Slovenia, let's say, let's say this uh, semi uh, dissident uh, magazines towards the Serbian intellectuals. 
Uh, it should be noted that Yugoslavia, as such, was uh, very uh, diversified. It was also always that the same rules and the same restrictions were applied through the whole country. Let's say, in '83, from the Ljubljana perspective, the Belgrade was center of liberty in Yugoslavia. So, from that point of view, uh, Mladina was interested to come in touch with uh, with ideas with uh, which were overspread and tolerate, tolerated in Belgrade. Later on, uh, this movement in Serbia was uh, annihilated, and then the center of let's say the, the new ideas uh, moved to Ljubljana. So. Uh, it would be of interest to have a, let's say, this historical span showing, and also, let's say, the Slovenian famous author uh, Drago Jančar, who was uh, uh, in in jail, and he was he was uh, also uh, excluded from from the uh, writing uh, society. Uh, he could uh, publish something or have some. Uh, theater pieces in Serbia in the same time. So that was not uh, completely completely uh, uh, uniform. But much more important question is uh, this relation between Yugoslavia and uh, East Europe. Uh, there was a trick done by Tito regime. He presented himself always as, a, as the most uh, democratic leader in, in Europe. So uh, let's say in the, in the 56th in uh, Budapest, he started with uh, supporting uh, Janos, uh, I mean, not Janos, <laughs> even a notch. Uh, but then he made a deal with Khrushchev to suppress the, the revolution. It was similar in the 68 in, in Praga, so, uh, and then in 17 in, in Poland, and before in 56 in Poland. Uh, so the, let's say, picture we, we, uh, we got in, in mass media, I must say for myself uh, also, it was that uh, East, East Europe was uh, considered as underdeveloped, uh, Country, not all, I mean, part of the world, not only in the question of, let's say, of the economy, but also we, we got a kind of arrogant er, uh, attitude towards them. We believed that's the, the highest uh, peak of, let's say, social, uh, socialism and its uh, forms of democracy. So we were ignorant. We were ignorant, and uh, our newspapers brought us only the, the, we didn't read about, let's say, about the Poland in 56, when they had elections uh, where uh, also non-communist, uh, uh, I mean, parliamentaries were elected. Such, such events were not uh, covered in our media. In our media, we covered only uh, the, the, let's say, the picture of, uh, suppressed nations uh, which have practically no liberty. And uh, it was the same, let's say, with, uh, with cinema. Uh, we again were arrogant. So we suppose that we, we are on the top of the, of the history of the East. And actually they were neglected the films of Roman Polanski, uh, Vida in, in the 60s, and especially, of course, Foreman in, in Czechoslovakia. I mean, Foreman became popular in Yugoslavia when he moved to the States, but before uh, he was um, ignored. So uh, that was a specific fabrication, uh, making the, the population of uh, Yugoslav nations uh, with, a, with a feeling of superiority, you know, considering either the Russians or whatever, Bulgarians. And instead of coming in touch 
with with let's say our colleagues in in, in those countries uh, instead of uh, make a discussion how to uh, how to oppose the the, uh, the 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 let's say the communistic uh, regimes we were uh, atom atomized atomized not knowing uh, what our potential uh, uh, let's say uh, um, collaborators uh, could give us and uh, from this point of view it would be also of interest uh, to see what's happening nowadays if we can share our let's say views our ways of transition our uh, mimicry of let's say uh, uh, nouveau class new the new and uh, uh, and also for, for these purposes i i never have in mind that there were a special funds available uh, for let's say scholars to, to to join or to to meet so i'm uh, actually very glad that you opened this question thank you for my part just i just to add a remark i think this um, special yugoslav situation is somehow uh, has somehow reason that uh, in principle we have we are dealing with two iron curtains one toward west from 45 and one toward east from 48 and uh, if before the war or with the birth of Slovenian national consciousness and so on, this Slavic alliance uh, was quite important after the 48, uh, nearly real, real cultural connections between these nations were practically dead. So it is, uh, it is a basic question for all of us. How are we dealing with it? Yes, please, who is next? Any of authors uh, would like to answer to uh, two questions? Yes, I, I, I would like to, um, to thank Jolan for her questions, because this is something we need to investigate deeper, of course. Both um, all three points you, you raised are very important. As for La Batana, yes, I think to raise this uh, special situation of uh, being based in Yugoslavia. So it was published in Fiume, but the um, uh, main editor was based in Belgrade. He was a professor of Italian at Belgrade. So we just managed to locate his archive, his personal archive, thanks to a colleague, Maria Mitrovic, whom I would like to thank for that. So we are eager to see what we can find in terms of relations and building links, uh, intellectual connections, and so on and so forth. But of course, the Italian minority was present in what now, uh, is now Slovenia and Croatia. So it is very difficult to, to, to define, I mean, a, a single identity to put in relation with other Eastern European identities. My impression is that the, the journal is really oriented towards uh, Italian culture, the main, uh, so that there was, um, yeah, there was some attention to other um cultural interesting topics uh, that were taking place in other eastern european countries but also um through the lens of italian culture i don't know that this is an impression i, I have to investigate we even i don't know if even agrees but even and i have to investigate deeper into that um as regards the 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 changes the development we try to say something about that even explain this point uh, we see a, a first moment of the journal where there was actually um, um, a, 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 an attempt to build a cultural community which was not identitarian at all, um, which was more based on the sharing of a critical Marxism, I would say. Um, and then we can see the, the emergence of uh, the topic of identity, of national identity, of uh, the identity of the Italian community, which takes then the first stage in 1990, I think, with the publication of Marti Muma, which is at the same time a very critical moment uh, towards the 
the regimes, as I, I, I try to explain. Um, but yeah, and, and then I want to say something about the fact that we decided to stop there because actually we think that the, the, the journal, the magazine became something else later. Um, that the, this idea of uh, the um, uh, affirmation of an identity, of a national identity became the main topic, uh, the main interest and left apart uh, all those contradictions and risks and ambiguities, which I was trying to talk about in my, in my talk, um, which I, I still find very, very interesting for both parts and for the idea of a literary magazine in general. As for the third point, uh, of course, it is very important. Uh, I mean, uh, La Batana reflects at the beginning uh, a very male dominated culture. <laughs> For example, in Grupo 63, um, I think there were a couple of women, not more. And uh, the editorial board was uh, totally male dominated in, in the first two series. Notwithstanding that, though, um, we, we find a lot of important names, especially in visual arts, uh, for example, Carla Cardi. So the, 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 the authors and the, um, the names present in the journal are much more interesting. I, I think they paint a picture, um, much more interesting picture, um, which, it, which is, I would say, further with regard to uh, Italian culture, which was at that time really had left really little space for um, women and uh, female or feminist point of view. I think Alinka... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, I forgot to unmute myself. Yes, yes. I can, can, I, <laughs> can, I, can I say that Alinka is with this, let's say, oppositional currents all the time? <laughs> and uh, I would say, um, also, when we see the photographs of uh, Slovenian oppositional movements that are, in principle, males, sometimes very drunk, sometimes less drunk, but uh, it would be fine to see some insider how she thinks about this, uh, this process of uh, feminization, because there were uh, gay and lesbian movements that also entered Slovenian society in the 80s. Can I offer an, an, an answer on a very different uh, type? <laughs> uh, I was intrigued by your uh, question number two. Uh, I'll offer some information first and then ask my own question. Uh, the journal Most, The Bridge, published in Trieste, uh, devoted the second part of its history of publication to being bilingual. It was published in Slovenian, and Italian language. All the articles, all the poetry, or pieces of uh, essays, and so on and on, were translated from one language to the other. And uh, this is one, this was their ambition from the very beginning. Uh, it started with the idea of bridge as a bridge between various types of Slovenes living in Yugoslavia, living in national minorities in Italy and Austria, and then displaced persons from all over the world. But then they moved on to the decision to bridge the difference, the cultural relationship in Trieste between Slovenes and Italians. And that's what they did from 1972 until the very end, which was in 1992. Um, so it is quite an important uh, ambition. 
Um, there are not many Italian authors, but there was a small devoted group. Uh, I can only now remember one name is Gino Bragiaduro. Uh, and I would like to ask Sergia if you are aware of it. Is there any uh, any study published on it? Uh, last year, at this time in autumn, I organized a symposium on Moss and the Liu. This is the book that came out afterwards. And uh, there was a paper by Loredana Umek, who devoted, who was devoted to this very issue. Thank you. Yeah, Sergio, would you like to say something? Yes, thank, thank you very much, Alenka. I think that it was Vesna's idea to make a comparison, to put uh, our yeah. objects of study on, on, yeah. on the same space and try yeah. to... I, I think that it's very important, actually, because it has never been done. Uh, nobody has ever thought of these two words as something that could be seen in a part parallel in comparison. So I think it is really very important that we have this kind of dialogue. On the one hand, a journal uh, published in Italian on the other side of the Iron Curtain. On the other hand, a journal published in Slovenian and Italian on in Trieste. So I, I think that even the panel we managed to put together, again, thanks to Vesna's idea, it's something, it's already an achievement. It's a, a starting point for um, yeah, for our dialogue to see the, the similarities, which have always been seen as some differences, but now we can start to see things from another perspective. And thanks also to the project, because it is the this framework that gives us this opportunity. Right. Thank you. As colleague Stepatz has, has mentioned, the project is also uh, somehow push up for, for thinking opposition in Slovenian framework. Um, and I would say to present them in the book. Um, I must say Leo Detela, who was one of the collaborators of Botana, and he was he he escaped from Yugoslavia after uh, Professor Slornak was banned from university. And later he wrote in his memories that he escaped from two dictators. One was communist dictator Tito and the other uh, was his um, uh, his alcoholic father but he he developed a real career in connecting cultures I, I think it's very important to find uh, persons like him and also in Slovenian framework to see all this let's say effort that was as Marco has mentioned was not uh, on us uh, historian method or uh, so, and so on was not done yet I would say it's uh, fine uh, it's it's also for Slovenian society this this project is is uh, quite a uh, challenge and I think uh, the ideas that uh, Bernard Nishma has developed are in principle uh, basic for all environments we are dealing with so I think uh, this is a good, uh, let's say, a good confirmation of the project, as you have all mentioned. Is there anybody else to ask, to tell something, to... I think we are quite time consuming, but I think it was worth listening. It was worth uh, being together. Somebody else or can we wish all our colleagues uh, to do uh, such interesting presentations as we have done today? So I think we can finish and uh, the exhibition is going on, the meetings are going on and we are waiting the book. The book is coming and uh, Dr. Wolfgang Gürtschacher from University of Salzburg as head of editorial board 
I think he has nice worries how to 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 edit uh, such ambitious project. Thank you all, and we will see us uh, on next meeting.